Uh, welcome everyone to the um, third session of the Decentering Whiteness discussion series. Um, today's uh, session is on um, Indigenous experience. And now I'd like to uh, introduce all you folks to um, George and Andrew, who are the organizers of this particular discussion series. Both George and Andrew are um, Vancouver School Board employees, and they both work together at the uh, uh, McGee Secondary um, School. George is a counselor member of the Vancouver Secondary Teachers Association. And Andrew is the principal of the school and current chair of the Vancouver Association of Secondary School Administrators. Now, gentlemen, I will pass this on to you too. Thank you, Calvin. Thanks, Thanks Calvin. Thanks, Amelia. Um, I think if people don't mind, um, there's sufficient, there's not so many of us, which is fantastic in one hand and not so fantastic on another. I think about 30 or 40 folks actually registered for the session, but um, Nora, Kalen, Desiree, Magali, and Leanne, um, it, you guys seem to be the first main people in. Do you feel comfortable um, having, having uh, turning on your cameras or are you okay just with us going along like this? Or can we, or, or do you mind just turning on your cameras and waving at us so we can get a visual and say hi? Perhaps if you don't mind saying which district you're in or where about you're in in the province or country. Um, my name's Kaylin uh, Sheher and uh, I am with the Vancouver School Board. Thanks, Kaylin. Welcome. Um, Desiree uh, Magali. Hi, I'm from Desiree from Salmon Arm in BC. I'm on the unceded territories of the Sequatchewan people, and I work with UBC Okanagan. Welcome. Thanks. Welcome. And Magali or Leanne or Nora? Uh, my name is Leanne Roger, and I'm uh, from School District 50, Haida Gwaii, um, so the traditional unceded territory of the Haida Nation. Uh, and I'm actually currently in Vanderhoof right now on a work trip, but typically I'm on Haida Gwaii. Amazing, thank you. And Nora or Magali? I think Nora's eating dinner right now. Maybe we can get her after she's done. Totally understood. Can you um, hear me? Yes. It's okay. Uh, my name is Nora. <laughs> I'm uh, joining you from the, uh, the Vancouver School District, but I work in the early years and um, I'm joining you from home, uh, from the lands of the Tawasan Semiamo uh, uh, First Nations. And uh, yeah, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Christy Major um, uh, joined us uh, at, in Surrey, and I was just wondering if you knew him or somehow related. No, probably not. <laughs> Sorry? That, that you were asking if I knew someone? Yeah, Tennessee Major. No. Just no. an awesome young kid that joined us from the States and up in, in Surrey about 15 years ago. In any case, oh, wow. um, welcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then Alpha, we, we know, I believe. Um, everyone, Alpha, do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Alpha, and I'm from uh, Help Change My City, a community organization that is uh, privileged to have the opportunity to, to walk alongside, you know, you know, principals, vice principals, and counselors in uh, the Vancouver School District. And uh, I work with youth and young people. And it's a privilege to walk alongside the great work that uh, you know the people in the district are doing in order to bring in the young people and teach them and see them succeed. Thanks so much, Alpha. Glenn will be joining us just now. Um, and by way of introductions, uh, we are on the Musqueam here at McGee. We are on the Musqueam territories, um, part of uh, the Musqueam Nation um, and 
there's a lot of work which we at the school are doing in terms of reconciliation and resurgence. Uh, and Glenn's work has been inspirational in shifting our perspective and my perspective um, as an administrator and then talking and discussing some of it with, uh, with George around from um, reconciliation to resurgence perspective. And so when he joins us, if people have managed to read his book or read sections of his book, um, that part of the debate I think is really, really important and we might um, raise some questions. Certainly we'll, I'll raise a question um, because in, in conversation with Glenn last night, I was saying we'd like to go along and talk a little bit more about the difference in the dialectic between uh, reconciliation and resurgence. Um, and from his perspective as a Dene um, First Nations person, um, we'd like to go along and explore that piece a little bit. Um, and, and so uh, that's sort of setting up some of the conversation. As, as you know, this is the third of the session, um, and we're trying to understand our position um, as white settlers um, and our racialized presence in the school environment and how that structures interactions with students and with staff and with each other um, and how it develops around curriculum and the organizational form and flow in the school. Um, and we've here at McGee, we've had, um, I've just been reflecting on an incident and a, and a series of incidents in the school and how I think a lot of it comes from a racialized positioning of a new immigrant student. And if that student would be a white kid coming in, um, I think some of the reaction to the boy would be very different to um, the way I think he's being positioned and read from within Vancouver narratives um, of color um, and difference. And uh, this, it's, I think, an important piece when um, just today a colleague was saying that McGee has is, is got a good name as an anti-racist school. Um, I went along and said, oh, you know what? We've got a lot of wokish positioning. We've got a lot of stuff here, but I don't see the change that's occurring inside um, and the fundamental uh, language and ways of being of the students. Um, and, and I think we've got a lot of work still to do. Um, so I think that by way of an introduction, that's, that's one of the pieces that I wanted to say. Let me see if I can flick to the next slide. Yeah, so we, we, we'll come back to some of that. I think really, George and I were, um, have used this film invasion um, in a series of student workshops at the school. And it's a fantastic uh, piece of resource sharing. Um, and it's an incredible video that really centers and shows the um, struggle at the Unistoten camp um, for, on the uh, Gitsakan nation up north, uh, where we have the attempt to build or the building up a pipeline across First Nations land. Um, and the different values and the different value systems, the different notions of relationality. Um, and it's really helped me to understand um, the concept and, and the importance of land defenders and if I look at the students in my school and when they graduate, I think, uh, well, is this an effective educational institution? Um, and that I, I, for it to be an effective educational institution, I would like to have students having a better understanding of what it is to be a land defender and why that is necessary and important at this point in, in um, our local history and in our personal histories and our personal paths. Um, and I would love to have every student at McGee graduating saying I'm a land, land defender and using that language. That would be my um, vision. Um, but um, so we've used it in different ways. We've used it in a staff meeting, for example. Um, and then we've had in our semester turnaround experience last year and again this year that we're going to be having where students sign up for workshops. This is a, a film that um, students are expected to sign up for and watch. Um, and then there's some guided questions that. Um, that are available from the website um, when you follow, it, follow up on it. So I would encourage the sharing of this resource, but we're gonna watch it together for the first, um, I think it's about 15 minutes long. Um, and there are three kind of phases in the film um, that each, if I were to use this again in a workshop, each phase, you could watch the whole thing and then watch each phase um, and discuss the three different key, key parts of this. So while you watch it, um, uh, I think you'll be fascinated to see um, the issues and how, how they're portrayed and developed and the, the central voice um, of indigenous women in, in this film. That's that I think uh, we can come back to and bring up with Glenn as well. 
Um, so if let's see if if you get the sound on this and how well that works. Otherwise, um, George has very kindly put the link in the sidebar. Um, but uh, here we go. Let's see how it works. So um, welcome back. Uh, if, I hope everyone is back again. Um, any thoughts from you guys out there in, in different parts of our province after watching that before Glenn joins us? Any thoughts that come to mind? Um, oh, I'm just going upstairs. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I was just, um, sorry, I'm going to be there. Okay. That's okay. I was just ex extremely upset <laughs> and uh, really upset, upset, upset me watching the video. And um, another thing is that I'm embarrassed to say that I still don't know what's happening with uh, the people in their land and um and yeah it was very upsetting for me to watch mm -hmm. yeah nora I, I i absolutely agree with you and that's why we need to watch it and that's why we need to uh, introduce it into our staff meetings and have a facilitated conversation about it because this is a, a small example of what is occurring everywhere um and uh so it's it's a rich film which introduces a lot of the core topics uh, around settler um, indigenous relationships in Canada um, so yeah thank you for for being upset I think it's important that we are I think we must be angry because if we are feeling this way how how are indigenous people in our country feeling um, so absolutely so thank you for that um, anyone else um, Leanne, from your experience in Haida Gwaii and now up in Van der Hoof, Desiree up in Salmon Arm, any, if you're out there, if, if you're, your thoughts, your experience, any sharing at this point? If you're back with us. Well, I wanted to echo um, what uh, Nora just said as well, because it is upsetting and I think it is also good for us to be upset. Um, I am geographically close to that area. Um, and, you know, like, I mean, even on my way to Vanderhoof, I drew, drove through uh, the territory. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's something that, um, like, I mean, obviously I don't have any answers and that's exactly why I'm here today is to try to learn uh, more about these things that are going on in the province. But, um, you know, really just to, just to echo what Nora had said a few minutes ago, how upsetting it is. and you know, just the level of frustration and, and anger and, um, you know, it's so understandable. Uh, I, I really have a lot of compassion for, for that, like, feeling like no one's listening to something that you've been saying for thousands of years and just feeling like you're being completely like steamrolled by um, organizations and the government and all the rest of it. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's it's a, a really great twenty minute uh, film yeah. to watch for sure. Yeah. Like with with um, larger groups of people for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really well done and really captures. Like, I mean, obviously, I don't know all the ins and outs of the situation, but um, mm -hmm. to you know be a good starting point for a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, Leanne. Exactly what um, you know, George and I feel when we showed it in our staff meeting um, about a year ago, and then when we have it in the student workshops and the student groups, um, and that's a bit of a facilitated dialogue. Um, and unfortunately, so far, no students have signed up to go during the summer to go and join the camp. Um, but we're hoping that eventually some of the kids will go along and sign up as, as rather than going to summer school and doing an extra physics class, go and join the work camp, go and join the camp. Um, it's a process and there's an interview process. Um, 
not anyone can just walk onto the land and, and say, hi, I want to join this blockade. Because um, from my experience in South Africa, that's it's a great way to go along and put in infiltrators mm -hmm. um, and then introduce division into, into what could be a unified situation. You know, have adjuncts provocateurs coming in um, and disrupting a situation. So there is a process um, you apply to go. Um, and if people are interested, it's all available on, on their web page. Um, also, as you saw in the very last minute, uh, you can then there's an encouragement to go along and show the film. Um, and then there's a, some workshop based questions as well um, in terms of a study group. So if you want to follow up with that, um, please go ahead. Any other comments and thoughts? Um, Kellen, maybe, or Desiree, anyone? I don't mind jumping in. Yeah. Um, I, I also found it very frustrating um, re-watching and remembering a lot of um, things that had gone on in the beginning of this and how it escalated to a point. Um, and now how it's kind of fallen off the radar and whatnot, which is um, a question I have as to why, right? Like what, mm -hmm. what has happened in that it now is not part of the conversation that are, is going on. I know I had a lot of conversations with people around what does it mean to be an elected chief or a hereditary chief? And, and how does the power struggles occur in these situations? And why um, industry really chooses to go the elected route as opposed to the traditional route and, and what actual reconciliation means in these cases. Um, and the constant um, conversation matter around colonialism and what colonialism looks like nowadays, right? It's not something that just happened, you know, 200 years ago. And it's something that is still perpetuating itself again and again and again every day. And um, so having that conversation with people that don't think along those lines or haven't had the, um, the push to think about those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is how segregation works. And so that's how segregation worked in South Africa, is that in our white enclaves, um, you could very easily forget what's going on over there. Uh, and this is partly why we design a route in a certain area in, in a remote uh, rural um, area, so that it's not only the shortest route down to the water, um, but it's also supposed to be in a re remote area where we can forget about it and it's it's not part of our consciousness and we focus on our day-to-day -day struggles um, so absolutely it's fallen off the radar it's because for for good political reasons because um, we aren't supposed to be politically engaged in some of these issues um, so yeah go to carry on with what you said <clears throat> the woman in the in the video she made such a great point what her grandfather told her is to reoccupy the lands because when there's nobody there and you mentioned they were going through a, uh, an area that was, uh, I can't remember the word you used, but it was more like wilderness. Um, and now her grandfather told her to be back in the lands to reoccupy them because if there's nobody there, it's just so much easier for anybody to steamroll through there. And that was also part of the, the, the genocide of the colonial project was to depopulate the land um, and to bring about reserves um, and have indigenous people confined to reserves uh, and depopulate it. later on in, in this presentation. We have a, a very short piece from Clearing, Clearing the Plains, which is another beautiful book that, that is important reading, I think. Um, but also the use, the depopulation of the land, Alpha coming with your ancestry in Uganda and, and my experience in South Africa, the reserve system um, was exactly what is also being used and what was exactly what is imposed on indigenous people in this country, um, because it was the same logic of colonialism um, and the same double-edged sword of military might um, and uh, cultural destruction. Um, Alpha, your thoughts? I don't think you've watched that film, hey? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, that yeah. was pretty, um, pretty powerful. It disturbs the heart. And uh, one of the things that uh, in the midst of it all is, you know, people sometimes can look at it as conflict and they're here to do just 
you know, blockade or a cap and this kind of thing. But they there's there's a mission and a vision behind that is the hope that they talk about. You know, it talks about, you know, having the people move into the place. And there's a vision and a mission. It's not just to be in in, in conflict. The drive mm-hmm. is not just conflict. And I'm I'm really that also drove me because as you feel the pain, the question is, and what I think is really important is is, is why. But when they answer that why, we want to see our people on this land. We want to see our people living here, harvesting. That's what she talked about. She started talking about harvesting, living, and even learning, bringing back the languages and living a life. And uh, I know that, you know, that's that that's where the song comes in for us. And we know that in Africa, the song, music and song kept everything together because we the songs would be about tomorrow's victories and tomorrow's hope and mm-hmm. tomorrow's mm-hmm. and that's that's really what it's all about and and as we all walk to the table we must fight and i've said this before in different segments is that we must fight to get to that table um but even the you know the gesture of water and cigarettes like i, I thought about that for a minute and i said really like what does that look like? And in the eyes of, of, of the people that, you know, I think that these, you know, a 24 bottles of water and two packs of cigarettes should be, you know, is, is a token of some kind, do you understand what I mean? So yep. it's, it's yep. important to really recognize the people and, and to, you know, I saw that and I was just like, how does this work? And what does that look like, mm-hmm. right? But the hope stayed alive for me in, in it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are a couple of times where the, the disjuncture between settler and indigenous worldviews was just so incredibly well done. Uh, the very beginning with the police um, saying, yeah, there's this box over here. And we are, we're like grumpy because there's this box that was left here. Um, and then Freya says, yeah, this is part of our ceremony. We were having ceremony here. Um, and the police officer who, I don't know if he goes to church or what, but his spiritual relationship is his and Daba. Um, and Freya was, repli- was speaking about a very different spiritual relationship because the water is threatened and the water is life. Um, and there was a, a, a phenomenal, sh- you know, the way they presented that. The other one was, was the one exactly when, you know, much, much later that you're referring to Alpha. Um, and Freya says, oh, I think it might have been Tilly. Uh, who are you? Um, and the person gives his name. And then she says, where are you from? And, and the person said, I'm from Chevron. And like, I'm thinking like, well, yeah, and that's the fundamental problem because you're not from here. You're not, you don't worship these waters. You don't realize the significance of the waters and the land that gives the people in the community nourishment. He's from Chevron, a multinational corporation um, and a corporation that I think would, should have um, social scientists or researchers or anthropologists could say it might be insulting to go along and offer 24 bottles of water to to these the indigenous people and the piece of tobacco well we understand there's a cultural and a historical piece to that but that has also been perverted in the current context so i mean it was phenomenal to see the different worldviews one other piece that i wanted to speak about is and maybe when glenn joins us and it's 448 i hope he can I hope he's going to make it and i hope he gets the link um so so one other thing was the resurgence and the notion of resurgence and if we could just talk glenn, about that yeah glenn's here oh wicked um uh glenn um we're just talking about i'm not sure if you've you know the film invasion um around the unistoten camp um yeah. and the wetsuwet'en nation um, um glenn do you want to just say hello um there's about eight of us that are present but um do you want to turn on do you have screen do you have a video there yeah i'm here Oh, wicked. Hi, Glenn. How are you? I'm good. Fantastic. Are you... <laughs> Sorry? I'm tired. Oh, well, um, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Much. Really appreciate it. Um, do you want to give a little bit of an introduction to yourself and, and your background and a little bit of introduction? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Glenn. I've been a prof in um, the Criti- or Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies at UBC for... I guess 13 years now. Um, I'm also a professor in poli sci, uh, the Department of Political Science. 
And I do, uh, and I'm an affiliate uh, prof in, in the Department of Geography. Um, I also um, helped establish an anti-colonial uh, land-based school in the north. Um, we're kind of situated outside of Yellowknife um, with um, uh, employing uh, lots of people from the uh, Yellowknife Dene First Nation, which I'm from. Um, but now we we do uh, we help facilitate community uh, based land based uh, education um, in a number of places across the north, including the Beaufort Delta and uh, in the Casca region of the Mackenzie Mountains, um, and in around Whitehorse. Um, yeah, that's about it. Oh, and I'm uh, I'm trained as a political theorist. That's all, Glenn. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, not everyone would have read um, Redskin's White Mask. And could you just give a little summary around that, your key, the key arguments um, around that book and how they relate to reconciliation and resurgence? Because right at the beginning of, of today before you, you you joined us i mentioned the this the dialectic between reconciliation and resurgence and perhaps if you have any thoughts about that um and everyone has just watched invasion um and i was just to start about to start speaking and pointing to, to some aspects of resurgence that are illustrated in that film um and what what white allies might be able to do and have a role in terms of reconciliation resurgence or just keeping quiet sometimes and listening and learning what would your thoughts be and and reflecting on that from your book uh well the book's kind of old now but i think that it's um so it was published in 19, or, uh, 2014 but it took about i guess just about 10 years to write um and uh it goes to the question of of i forget who who mentioned on uh like what happened to um um Unistoten and how it came to uh kind of um shift from the um the point of view that had gathered uh, quite a bit of momentum and urgency behind it and how and how it is uh it's um uh, dramatically less in the public uh i or mine uh now and i think that that my book um was attempting to uh to understand a similar thing and that's at least partially through the accommodation of indigenous claims in a way that still um holds up the ultimate structure of dispossession that that is um, that is that is uh stands behind the colonial relationship now uh so this gets at um like for instance um, including indigenous peoples in or the uh, indigenous peoples in negotiations over economic uh, benefits uh, that come from the exploitation and dispossession of their their lands as opposed to um, um, having a substantive say um, by those who resist it in accordance with uh, um, traditional frameworks or other normative sort of understanding so that's partially it. so it's like not talk to the bad indians but talk to the good indians who who have pressure from communities for um to uh, economically benefit from um essentially um um extractive industries that are going to going to happen on their land whether or not uh, they have a say in it so that's partially a reason why Unistoten is isn't as as sharp in in people's um, um, minds. Um, the second uh, thing is like I don't know if you remember uh, just before lockdown um, or, or the pandemic, uh, it was explosively happening across the country. It had leaked out from the traditional territories of the Wet'suwet'en, and there were roaming blockades um, all over mm -hmm. Vancouver. Um, British Columbia, most urban major or major urban centers in in Canada, and then there was the uh, the Mohawks who had uh, blockaded yeah. um, um, the major railway corridor between Montreal and and Toronto um, to the point where um, uh, Trudeau had expressed um, their illegality and to 
um, and was undertaking measures to um, um, to release the the uh, um, flows of capital and goods mm -hmm. um, coming from and dependent on that critical infrastructure. So it was an absolutely effective of a means of getting one's uh, message out there to the point where where Trudeau is willing to take um, a significant action, um, but at the cusp of um, of uh, the lockdown. So the, the lockdown, I think, um, really um, had a, a, a major impact in terms of um, the efficacy of of what the um, um, Una Stoughton camp and and the Gitterman checkpoint and mm. so on had mm. had um, um, was undertaking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and we haven't gained that momentum uh, momentum back. But these things tend to like. Unfortunately, it's it's just it's crisis situations that that propel this type of um, that propel. Um, many non-natives and in, in particular white people to to pay attention to this so um, and we haven't we haven't we have yet to see that 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 cycle rear its rear its head again so I don't know about that then uh, some some of what you're saying comes to the next slide um, but could you just speak a little bit about I think it's important for colleagues to know a little bit about Franz Fanon and his world um, and how how important Franz Fanon's thinking was, because I think even in the film, um, I think it was Freya towards the end when they're speaking about the healing center and the importance of the healing center and the vision of the healing center and, and the colleagues who are watching that. And there was the aerial, the beautiful aerial shot of the healing center with the solar panels and the various aspects of that vision. Um, and Steve Biko had many aspects of the same approach to small and micro enterprise development as an aspect of resurgence um, and of um, pan-Africanism. Uh, that, that was being illustrated in the film. And that comes a lot from Franz Farnon. And I know that you, you've spent some time reading his work. Do you have any, anything you'd like to share on that one? Yeah, um, I'm just trying to give a new twist on it. Like the book is a, a critique of uh, the way that settler colonialism reproduces itself, uh, not solely through violence, although violence um, um, maintains a or is maintained as a background structure. So when the when the to use Unistotin as a as an example, when when indigenous people or the native or whatever. Um, doesn't reconcile uh, themselves and their interests with that of colonial capital or the state or whatever. Uh, violence will always um, um, be resorted to, as we saw with uh, police invasion of that of that territory. Um, but it's also reproduced through um, scripted forms of recognition, which over time can change the subject positions of Indigenous negotiators and, and community members themselves. So this, I claim, happened um, um, largely, uh, but not exclusively, after 1969, where before 1969 in the, in the white paper, which was a very uh, assimilative document, uh, Native people didn't really have uh, very many rights that they could bank on, at least legible by the state. And it was after 1969 that um, the federal government changed course, um, started um, dispossessing land through processes of extinguishment that were ostensibly negotiated uh, or, or at, at the negotiating, negotiating table rather than uh, done through um, at the barrel of a gun sort of thing. And this uh, insight, this shift in the kind of operating logic of colonial dispossession, um, I took as being a central um, and key argument um, that Fanon um, makes with regard to the absence of uh, struggle and later armed struggle in in the in the decolonization right. movement in his critique of of um of hegel's master slave dialectic mm -hmm. so it's just it was um a fancy way of of um uh, gaining this key insight into how structural relationships of colonial rule 
are maintained actually through scripted forms of recognition rather than entirely against them like previous eras. And I think that Fanon um, was really insightful into that. Now, since then, um, uh, I didn't really get into how I came um, across Fanon in, in this context. And uh, I guess some within some sectors of the academy, largely, um, it's challenged as not a, like just a use of this theoretical sort of insight in a different context, like um, to understand uh, colonial relationships in, in, in a settler uh, state like Canada, um, as opposed to um, 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 relationships between France and Martinique, where Fanon was from, mm. or between France and Algeria, where Fanon uh, became an adoptive kind of uh, revolutionary. In. Uh, so it was uh, interpreted by uh, by some as an appropriation or a misuse. It's black skin, white masks, not red skin, white masks. Um, so my newer work goes into um, the dissemination and the way that these uh, revolutionary theories uh, uh, have traveled across across the globe and taken up in very local um, context specific um, struggles. So, so it uh, it was an unfortunate um, omission that I had in the first book was to show that Fanon was a like a very 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 important thinker um, to the indigenous um, communities in, in Canada, including uh, Yellowknife, where I'm from. Um, but um, but so were were the theories of um, of uh, Mao Zedong. Um, uh, Julius Nairi in in uh, in Tanzania was super important here in British Columbia uh, through uh, people like George Manuel, um, whose granddaughters are now uh, the tiny house warriors and the encampment that they have against um, the pipelines in uh, Blue River. Um, so the way in which these ideas have have gravitated or uh, gravitated to specific places in their travels and taken on a life of their own, providing insight and um, and um, um, visions of a of a uh, anti colonial or decolonial future. And I, I, we're looking for. I want to read that book and and as a mentioned before i hope that you're going to give a great dedication to me in there but now uh, but now you know where the phrase you used just now the scripted forms of recognition and and here at mcgee with alpha helping us out and working together with george and i um and we're so concerned about and and right at the beginning of the conversation i mentioned that um you know oh, we sort of mcgee is recognized as being one of those schools that is trying to push it but I'm saying, that, well, no, it's just everything is the scripted form of recognition. And uh, I'm really concerned that that's what we're doing is we're having a Musqueam staircase with Deborah Sparrow's art. We've got uh, Chris and Crystal Sparrow's art. And then we've got, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, Shane Point's carvings. And, but what is fundamentally changing in the insights into our kids? And what's fundamentally changing around the understanding of race and racism and coloniality, et cetera, et cetera, and the insights of our kids and teachers. And I'm frustrated, perhaps, that we are just re reiterating a, a nice scripted form of recognition. And, and then we can say that we're um, happy to live, learn, and play on the ancestral territories. And, and it's a very scripted form of recognition. And I think that's where it's really important to bear in mind in, in your book, your, your earlier book, um, that I'm not mentioned is the res resurgence of five theses um, and the necessity of direct action. And you spoke to that just now. Capitalism, no more wealth. It has to change because this is the last two sessions and, and this, the decentering um, conversation is around uh, the relationship with um, global warming and climate catastrophe. Um, so these are all intersectional issues dispossession, gender justice and decolonization, and then beyond the nation state. Um, and I think Freya's, the film showed uh, the importance of that and linking that also with the United Nations as a, as a site of struggle. Um, interestingly, in, um, in the video, all the speakers were women. Um, and the role of, of woman leadership, I think, is, is, is 
came through a little bit there. The obvious other piece around um, missing and murdered indigenous women um, and the patriarchal, white patriarchal um, re uh, responsibility there that is um, spoken to on, on certain days and then forgotten about quietly. Do you have any, any thoughts and any comments around um, the five theses? Uh, and any 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 your your later thinking around that? I think uh, my thinking is pretty consist consistent. Like they're broad, like jabs. Um, I think that direct action is what uh, um, gets the goods, so to speak. Like um, if you look at the history of of indigenous struggle in Canada, the only like the things that that um, that have pushed the conversation, not only the conversation forward, but like uh, material gains forward has been has been blocking flows of capital coming out of indigenous communities um, through um, um, infrastructures that were built to to do such things. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, dominant politics has portrayed it as like these are this is um, this is a willing um, um, outcome of of uh, peaceful negotiations, but but that's just an unsustainable argument. They've always um, been. Um, it's always come out of. Um, um, well, in this country, um, in particular, um, um, the tactic or strategy of the blockade. Mm -hmm. um, I cap uh, capitalism, as I like articulated in the book, is uh, it's it's inherently um, dispossessing. Like it, it it cannot not not be. Um, so so I um, try and think through. Um, and this is to get at um, um, one of your points uh, too, is that the blockade isn't just blocking flows of capital, it's a microcosm of um, like at an unisoton of, a, of an alternative uh, way of living, um, but also an alternative um, uh, mode of production uh, on the territories. Um, it is a reproduction of that society on a, mi on a, on a micro scale, um, which includes a sustainable political economy based on a revitalization of traditional activities like, like hunting, fishing, trapping, and so on, and, a, and a, like a stewardship over that community or over those, uh, quote, natural resources. Um, it's a microcosm of education where it's educating uh, people in um, alternative political economies, but the languages that infuse them. Um, and, and this is all well while actually def defending um, a land and way of life um, in a in a in a more assertive sort of way so I think that that's that's important um, what's important about that though is um, is that it needs it needs support and solidarity from from um, non-indigenous people but also but also indigenous um, folks um, so it's a kind of a networked sort of um, uh, system of mutual aid and and uh, and material support, um, including um, indigenous people in the city. Like <laughs> for too often until recently, um, and it's like upwards of sixty percent of of our of our people live in urban centers. Uh, but that wasn't um, until quite recently um, thought of in any sort of political or jurisdictional way. It was uh, seen as a cultural thing, like how like uh, the first arguments about urban indigenous peoples were like how they could have of how they formed communities and avoided assimilation or or been marginalized uh, through the process. And I'm just I just think that more serious thought and action needs to be um, a place in the like in dealing with, mm -hmm. with um, urban indigeneity um, that marginalization it's gentrification as a as a contemporary urban form of dispossession and so on like uh, that the literature on gentrification and urban development all pay uh, metaphorical um um homage to this being a colonial activity but i, I but they have yet to or in, until recently um 
um, looked at it actually as a, as a material form of uh, a neocolonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, gender justice and decolonization, Andrew, you're right. Uh, most of these are, um, are um, women-led um, and um, it's just kind of constantly like in honing or or demonstrating uh, not only that how um, this leadership is um, necessarily uh, that, but the ways in which uh, settler colonial dispossession and genocide has always been asymmetrical in its in its uh, in its in its targets, and its targets have have uh, uh, overwhelmingly. Um, um, been women and queer and two spirit folks, and um, and again, like capitalism, I don't think like the, the beyond the nation state is just to demonstrate or my concern that um, jurisdiction, as is understood with the state form, is also always uh, dispossessive. Um, the centralization of political authority and its jurisdiction over land um, um, has always um, uh, understood um, uh, territoriality in a way uh, that has has served to uh, to undermine uh, uh, previously self determining uh, communities and, and land bases. So I think that uh, the state logic of the state. Um, its understanding of the land, its understanding of territory and jurisdiction is um, is as uh, it, it it is as dispossessing as as capitalism. Um, insofar as like if you if you uh, maintained say a socialist uh, version of the state, you're still gonna you're still exactly. gonna exactly. Um, um, um a dispossessive logic um to it yeah 100 percent. That's, that's, uh, that's obviously a long-term goal but <laughs> well it's essential it and yeah it's essential and i mean there's so much glenn there um and all of us here are colleagues working together in the education system which is a fundamental such a intricate part of the nation state uh, along with health and then the structures of, of legal jurisprudence, uh, which governs land ownership, et cetera, et cetera. And that comes back to the, the point that I, I the, the question sort of thing that I raised with you last night around uh, Hume and Locke as these foundational political scientists and theorists in the 16, 1700s of, in, in Europe and was on their thinking of uh, their conception of modernity and Leviathan and all of that good stuff that so much of the modern state has evolved and developed and then uh, in opposition to that we had the German thinkers right um, but but the important part about that is like um, these things are usually thought of as separate from imperialism or colonialism but these uh, these thinkers were were dealing uh, with uh, an age of empires. So Locke's yep. writing um, his second treatise, which is like a, a proto sort of and foundational to contemporary liberalism. And he's thinking about the problem of how to justify taking land from, yep. uh, from um, Indians. Yep. Um, and some of them were slave owners too. And, and yeah, yeah, the fans in a bunch of nasty pots. There we are. Now, you know, I'm thinking through those five theses of yours there and the importance of resurgence within all of them. And when we talk about decentering whiteness, I think really, and, and people can ask and say, well, you know, you guys, what do you mean and what do you think about? I would think that in, in much of what you're summarizing there is a version of, of, um, uh, decentering whiteness because capitalism has been so much a fundamental part of the emergence of modernity and and european thought centered in, in whiteness um and all of this really brings us to a, the current climate catastrophe that we're facing and we don't really have all that of that much time to go beyond the nation state to address some of these kinds of things and i think that's why it's an important that we can even have five or six of us because all of us carry on these conversations and thinking when we are in our classrooms on a daily basis um we i'm concerned a little bit about running out of time um this will be all available um 
And what I just want to come to is one or two other small pieces. Um, and back in the summer, um, my wife and I um, did some kayaking in the Broken Islands group, what's currently called the, the Gro Broken Islands. Um, and one of the places we were encouraged to go to was what's an island called Tarot Island and found this tree. Um, and this is a 1000 year old cedar tree. Um, and that's Suzanne sitting at the base of that tree. And, and um, unfortunately, that picture, that image doesn't capture it very well, because if you go up close next to it, um, you see the knots in the tree and you see the multiple stories around every knot and cranny and, and the, the wisdom and the insight in that tree, the experience. It's, it's just it's a mind blowing experience to go and look at a tree like that. Um, and when it comes to the notion of relationality and relationships with the land and relationships, land and water as our ancestors, um, it was, it's, a, it's an experience that I think it's important for all of us to go to, um, because at the same time, um, we are having a desire to log and continue logging old growth, and that we can even conceptualize of logging um, at this point in, in history. A tree like that um, and so in this conversation around decentering whiteness and going beyond capitalism we have that capitalist system which thinks that part of its logic is to cut down a tree like that uh, and can justify cutting down this this um this raw material quote unquote glenn your experience up on in the Diné lands and your experience around uh, relationality um any am i i don't want to speak on your behalf perhaps the land schools that you're you're developing um and do you any thoughts it's a, um, like a, a big uh, project so like the education that we provide uh, serves as a way to justify the distribution of resources and money that we're able to wrestle from um, largely the uh, two levels of government, so the GNWT and, and the state, and redistribute it into um, although it's not expressed in this terms, an alternate political economy that that is based on 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 um, uh, on the land. So we're paying, we're able to pay uh, people, um, in particular elders and land users, um, to teach uh, the next generation of the importance and ethics. Um, behind uh, such a um, um, sustaining uh, oneself and then drawing them out of the dominant economy in the north which is um, which is uh, mining or or oil and gas so it's so it's uh it uses our organization and skill set in, in getting uh that cash in order to create the um um econ or to to re jumpstart the economy mm -hmm. um in that sort of way um um it also like as an educational vehicle we're not just about uh, uh, we're not solely about those practices or revitalizing those practices and 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 knowledges. Um, we're also um, teaching a younger generation of what that sort of um, practical theoretical sort of knowledge that they're gaining from um, harvesting medicines, hunting, um, working with fish, moose hide tanning uh, teaches us about the um the colonization and ideally decolonization of the north so what does an emphasis on the relationality that that these practices embody uh, teach us about call or the uh the systematic um dispossession and and um devaluation of like um the the like often gendered nature of some of of these processes and uh the the centrality of uh, of indigenous uh women and families in in the in the reproduction of their societies um that capitalism constantly 
is clawing at and and rendering um, um, rendering like inoperable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a, it's a really sort of like this uh, the centering of land as a and land based practices as a framework for understanding um, our 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 colonial uh, present like but also um, as aspiring towards um, an alternate uh, future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that the thought came to earlier on when we were talking. Um, Going to scale. Let's let's put that use that phrase. Um, when there was the the viewpoint of the resurgence um, and macro enterprise development, um, what's so important is for us also to also to learn about um, are examples like the Mondragon cooperatives, um, and that we've had. We, there are examples of different forms of social organization um, with very different value systems. And we might call it socialist, but I think it would be that would be a bit of a, a denigration of what the folks in Mondragon are trying to do. Similarly, in, in Chile, there are many examples, and certainly in Africa, there are many examples, India, many examples of, of 10. 20, 30, 40, 50,000, hundreds of thousand people being organized around very different forms of social organization. So they yeah, do exist, right? Scale, it's um, like, um, what's his name? Um, the Suso Santos has a, a trilogy and one of them is called Another Production is Possible, mm -hmm. um, which is more accurately, Another Production is Actual. And he looks at um, um, the political economy of um the the global south um has a, a shit ton of of um non-capitalist forms of of uh economic activity and 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 production um that we in like the fortress of of the capitalist north um just it just falls out of our purview um but but people are dependent on it for their um for their sustenance and and reproduction of their societies all over the place it's mm -hmm. just it's just uh we have our blinders on yeah yeah um this is a close-up of the tree um and i was trying to capture that so that people could see some of the the deep stories that lie within that tree um, and I wanted to superimpose alongside that a quote from our very first session. Um, Glenn, I'm not sure if you've read um, Sven Landquist's books and some of his work. Um, and one of the points that he repeatedly made um, that in the first session that we were reading is, you already know enough. So do I. It is not knowledge we lack. What is missing is the courage to understand what we know and draw conclusions. Uh, and then Sven pushes us um, into action and being idle no more. Um, and I, I just wanted us in this session to be reminded of Lindquist's point that we do know, we have heard of these things and sometimes we forget um, and then we try to move on. Um, and which brings me to another part of the same trip that Suzanne and I were on. Um, and we're encouraged to go across to uh, the neighboring island from where we're camping, Benson, which, which is on the map called Benson Island or Sisnaath. Um, and one of the beach keepers um, from, the, from the Seashelt Nation uh, mentioned to us, so now go across there and you'll see the, uh, the original village site um, and the heart of the Seashelt Nation and, and his bait people. Um, and, and if you know um, Euclid and Tofino, um, that's the Seashelt Nation. Um, and the beach keeper mentioned to us, we, we said, you know, pre-contact, how extensive was your lands, were your lands? He said, well, no, from here and up just beyond uh, Tofino there, um, and Euclid and, and the Thousand Islands are just to the south of Euclid. Um, and how many people lived back in the day in contact um, when the Spanish and the English arrived? Uh, well, 35,000 people um, were living in, in that strip of land. Um, and and on the island there was nine thousand people living in the on in the in the in the town, um, which was com which was destroyed and and uh, now there's perhaps a hundred people in the Sea Salt Nation. So the question of genocide and reconciliation, um, um, genocide and resurgence, 
is uh, I think part of it's it's so easy for us to forget and not to realize the extensive nature um, of the genocide that occurred. Um, and then we talk sometimes about reparations. It's not very much a part of the dialogue. Um, Glenn, do you have any thoughts about reconciliation, resurgence, reparations, um, and the genocide and acknowledging what happened? How do we as settlers come to terms with that in our education institutions? Any thoughts there? Well, I... Uh, <laughs> this is the what is to be done question. <laughs> um, a reconciliation, uh, the literature, and more importantly, the institutionalization of reconciliation, I'm not a big um, fan of. I think it's inappropriate to a uh, country that isn't undergoing a transition in any sort of way mm. or hasn't undergone a transition in any sort of way. So I deal with this in in one chapter in the book where the reconciliation industry is importing stuff, um, institutional uh, policy um, 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 policies, which deal with uh, places that have uh, ostensibly moved from one form of rule to another. And reconciliation is um, again, ostensibly thought to aid in that process of transition. Mm -hmm. It's all the transitional justice literature, but in, in places like Canada, um, that transition has to be manufactured in a way to, in order to hold up a just society as opposed to yeah. uh, practices. And that's why um, residential schools uh, take predominant, like a, have a predominant or a dominant position within that discourse because they're closed now. Mm -hmm. They can say, uh, look, we this is part of our ugly past. Um, in order to reconcile, we have to we have to uh, move on. There needs to be apologies. Um, the wounded subjects that we've created, i.e., indigenous peoples, have to mm -hmm. have to have this to in order to move on and get on with business. And I think that that's uh, dangerous and. Uh, and um and serves the same function that Fanon saw as as uh, as um a uh, kind of a neoliberal neocolonial recognition recognition politics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yet <laughs> um I don't necessarily think that reconciliation as such is a bad like when when it's taken the lead of indigenous peoples is a bad bad thing to aspire of uh, um to like reconciliation as it's uh, expressed uh by indigenous peoples when they're allowed to uh, express it as such is is simply the need to to heal like individual reconciliation with oneself um in the wake of um like a like some sort of structural or symbolic violence and then uh, reconciliation um as some sort of um bettering of the relationship between um between um nations or or communities so the indigenous people and non-indigenous people and i think that those are admirable and if not required um aspects of our contemporary politics the reconciliation that that canada is committed to isn't about that though it's about uh reconciling the existence of indigenous peoples with the ultimate sovereignty of um the canadian state yeah. um, and and its predominant uh economic activity which which is uh um, um based on on profit and growth um and when that's the reconciliation uh, rendering things consistent between between that or within that, um, uh, it will inevitably uh, be asymmetrical and um, and not reconciliation at all. So it's a tricky kind of dance that you have to do. Mm. Um, it depends on who's saying it. Uh, depends on what the what the means and ends are in order to get there. Uh, but I don't think reconciliation. Um, as it is commonly envisioned by Canada is anything but like um, a more subtle, um, <clears throat> it's just all words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, otherwise, you, there's a reconciliation uh, for dispossession. 
um, and or it's reconciled. a reconciliation yeah. with its possession. Yeah, like, yeah. A, like a reconcile the 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 undermining of indigenous sovereignty and land mm -hmm. uh, with 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 Canada through a politics of of um, in, inclusion. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, First Nations can um, be included in the can be reconciled with with the economic activity going on on their territory, they may even be able or some people within that nation might even be able to benefit from it. Uh, but you should not understand it as um, being able to set up our own jurisdictions and say what and what what happens or what doesn't happen on our on our territories. Mm -hmm. um, I'm aware of the time. Do, Kaelin, Desiree, Magali, Alian, uh, any, anyone, any questions, Nora? Um, even Alpha, any 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 of you guys have any thoughts, comments at this point? You guys are all good out there, Alpha. You good? Um, it's a lot, a lot to take in. Yeah. yeah. So it, yeah. I, I need to kind of digest it and process. <laughs> and when I watched the the video, I I was thinking already. I'm sharing this with everyone I know. And uh, so, yeah, a lot to digest and think about. Thank you. Thanks, Amelia. No, I'm, I agree. And and this, yeah, we'll we'd I'd want to come back and rewatch um, just what we've talked about. And Glenn, thanks for you know the insights and what you've been saying. The, the, you've dodged the one question about um, uh, reparations. Any the notion of reparations have have you thought about that and where do you stand around re reparations it's not a discourse that is brought up um explicitly in the case of settler colonialism or reparation like like i'm pretty certain that um canada would see like its land claims as some sort of reparative like aspect to to its uh, version of whatever mm -hmm. um so it's not talked about in the context of like um like it is in the u.s with regard to slavery or latin america with regard to slavery mm -hmm. um but there is a uh like um a redistribution if you will of um of of resources um land um marginalized jurisdictions that that are available to indigenous people but it doesn't curb the the colonial impulse of of the project and that's in order to gain access to uh territories um um, th so the superscribed jurisdictions um, that are negotiated in self-government agreements are are pretty. Um, uh, it, it's pretty clear that um, that non-indigenous business interests um, take precedent in in such in such cases, or or uh, or there's a pro-business model in terms of the economic initiatives or or ventures that that would fund um, um, such governments and so on. So, so you could say that there is a, a repar uh, reparative or, or redistributive aspect to the politics of recognition, um, but it doesn't, it's, it's not built um, to, to be able to um, assert one's authority over one's life and lands in a way that's supposed to um, mitigate or <laughs> fucking indeed stop um um these these forms of um economic development on on our territories mm -hmm. thanks Amudin. um last opportunity for um participants to have a have a quick question um we won't be able to get to the rest of the slides um then but we will put it all up um, and the material will be available for people. I can only encourage you to check them out. Um, the rest of the session would be um, one piece on some of the music of Jeremy Ducher um, as, a, as just a beautiful um, musician from Toronto um, and 
the Wallastock First Nation um, yeah. over on that side. Um, it's just beautiful music, beautiful song singing. Uh, he found on wax tablets some of his ancestors um, and some of the recordings, and and he then interprets that in in a modern kind of a way using his classically trained uh, opera. But just beautiful. I would encourage you. Um, to listen to Jeremy Ditch's music if you haven't from the Wallace Stock First Nation. And then from the rest of the presentation we're going to look at, if we had time, uh, would be some examples from Australia um, and some music from Australia and some of the issues around Australia's shame, um, which echoes and parallels um, Canada's shame and South Africa's shame and the shame of of a white centered um, modernity. Um, the, the video by Stan Grant, a, a piece, Australia's Shame by Stan Grant, given in 2016. Um, if you're writing notes, uh, look that up. It's a very powerful, passionate um, speech um, that Stan Grant gave um, from an Aboriginal uh, Indigenous perspective in Australia. Um, and so all of these pieces work together uh, from for today's session, which was really focusing on indigenous experience um, and decentering um, the white perspective and the white understanding and trying to understand the history, um, which was presented in the video at the beginning. Um, going forward, uh, we look forward to connecting up in about a month's time, a month and a bit's time, um, in the next uh, three sessions, two sessions, I think it is, and we start looking at other, in, other intersectionalities um, and paths out towards uh, climate catastrophe um, and different ways of organizing around that too. Um, thank you so much for your time. I know it's been a lot. Uh, George and I, our emails are um, available um, through Vancouver School Board. Um, and if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, gcanavos at vsp.bc.ca, a Schofield at vsp.bc.ca. Um, if you're stressed and traumatized and anxious and feel like crying, that's, we understand, shoot us an email too, and we can connect you as well with some support. Um, Alpha Brother, thank you for being here. Um, Glenn, thank you for being here. I uh, really appreciate and look forward to catching you for a beer. Um, and um, Kaylin, Andrew, Nora. You yep. had one quick question. Right uh, on. Kaylin. Um, says, I have a question about these ideas within an early years elementary education context, but haven't fully formed it. My, maybe I can forward it later. And yes, I reiterate what Andrew said. By all means, please. Mm. And um, we will do our very best to continue this dialogue. And uh, this is not a one and done. Mm. We're, we're, yeah. Moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's a brilliant question. And 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 you know, how do I take this into early years in a in an elementary school or into my classroom at the elementary school? And those micro politics and the micro issues and take it into a staff room, which has its own history and dynamics and dialectics of that have um, accrued over time in many cases. Um, there are supports, there are processes. We we see this as as a, as a part of some of the other initiatives underway in the VSB uh, and the anti-racism work that um, there's a commitment by the VSB to be part of. Um, and there's certainly a lot of work within the union movement as well around that. Um, but shoot us the emails and we'll help connect you up with colleagues. Um, and, and also we'd like to learn from you too. Um, any material that you have to share, that'd be brilliant. Um, so on that, have a fantastic rest of your evening. If you're on the roads, drive carefully, um, and we can't wait to connect up in a couple of weeks. Thanks so much, you guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.